ערב טוב לכולם, שלום לצופים בבית, שלום לאנשים שמתחברים ברגע זה לאתר צ'ייס. כחלק מסדרת ההרצאות שלנו באוניברסיטה הפתוחה, אנחנו שמחים לארח להרצאה השלישית משודרת את פרופסור טרי אנדרסון מאוניברסיטת אטבסקה בקנדה, שייתן לנו הרצאה באנגלית מעכשיו ועד השעה שבע, The Promise of, Enhance, of Educational Social Software. ההבטחה שגלומה בתוכנות חברתיות כמו בלוגינג, וויקי ואחרות, הוא ידבר עליה. אתם מוזמנים להיכנס לאתר צ'ייס ולשלוח לנו דרך חדר הצ'אטים שאלות ובקשות, ואנחנו נעביר את השאלות שלכם למרצה, אז we go along. So, Terry, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Yoaf. Uh, Shalom. Uh, I am... Uh... I have a, a number of uh, PowerPoints, and I, I know I end up talking too quickly and maybe have too many PowerPoint slide shows, uh, slides, so I am very, I'm pleased that uh, our lecture this evening is being recorded, and I hope that you'll have a chance to, uh, to go back and, uh, and as well to uh, maybe uh, uh, look at some of the links that are included. But uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's a, very, it's a big thrill to come to Israel, be, mostly because of the good friends and the good company and the good food, but also because of the good weather. It was very, very cold in Canada when I left, so I'm glad to be here. Um, my topic, I changed it a little bit to talk about personal learning systems, or PLEs, personal learning environments, and you. Uh, and, uh, well, let's, maybe I should just take it away. Uh, my first slide, I don't know how many of you read Time magazine, but uh, if, you, if you're not aware, it came out in December, and the person of the year, of the year is you. Yeah, you are the person of the year because you're the person who's making a difference because of the technologies that allow you to be a publisher, to be a radio station producer, to be a TV station owner. And because you're a lifelong learner, uh, you are uh, the person of the year. And if you see the December issue of this magazine, if you look at the, where the you is on the screen, uh, you will see that there's a, uh, uh, it's actually a mirror, and so you can see your own face. And we might ask, what do these persons of the year want? Well, they want to learn things, and I'm sure you want to learn things, or you wouldn't be sitting here this evening. Uh, you want to, and you do, continuously move between on and offline. Uh, probably you're multicasting your attention between watching me and flipping between other screens, and uh, that's quite all right. Um, you're learning to recognize and demand quality when you invest in your learning. Uh, you're not prepared to just sit and be talked to all the time. You want to be active. You want to be there. You want to be a part of learning. Uh, and you know that there's uh, many ways to paths to learning. There isn't just one correct way to learning. And you use a wide variety of information and communications tools. So if you're a professional educator, how do you deal with these persons of the year? Well, I think that we have to start realizing as educators ourselves that, uh, that, uh, t that there's lots of huge changes coming. And we can't just sit and look at them, but we actually have to start using these tools to make a better world. And a better world I mean, in my profession means being a better teacher. In your profession, uh, it, it might mean many different things. But I think we have a responsibility to use these tools, and not just to make ourselves rich, but to really make a contribution to the world. So what I'm going to talk about is the net and the context of the net and the things that it affords us to do. And then I'm going to talk about personal learning environments, which are sort of the educational application of social software. And I'll uh, give some definitions and some issues, and uh, then I give a, an example of what we do at Athabasca University, in my course at least. And then I'll welcome uh, your comments or your questions. Um, the first uh, thing is, why is it an important issue? Why should we be involved in educational issues like social software? I guess the biggest reason is to remember that change doesn't happen by evangelists running around telling people that uh, they must change. Uh, it doesn't work by threats, and it doesn't work just by creating better technologies. But rather, change happens when, when teachers, administrators, and learners make it happen when we get personal benefits from it, when our organizations are ready for it, and when they're forced to become ready for it, and when there's pressure from, from governments, from individuals, and most importantly from, from, uh, from individuals uh, like yourselves, by students. 
And so that each of us is an agent for change and has a responsibility as well as an opportunity to use these technologies. Uh, this is a joke. I don't know if Chicken Little is, uh, is around in Israel, but it's a story that I grew up with. Uh, Chicken Little would run around saying that the sky was falling, and, uh, and he got a little cynical around age 40, and he said that the sky is not falling. It's just a crock of propaganda from a bunch of left-wing environmental wackos. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, uh, you know, we've, we're starting to believe this about environmental, about global warming now, uh, and we're, we're starting to get past the cynical age. And I think it's the same about all kinds of change and social change that needs to happen in our society. Uh, we, we can't afford to be cynical. We can't afford to dismiss people as environmental wackos. Uh, we have to, you know, realize that the net creates uh, great challenges for us, but it also creates great opportunities for us. Um, my own values, and I hope that they're values that, that you share uh, uh, with me, is that we can and we must continuously improve both the quality, the effectiveness, the appeal, the cost, and the time efficiency of our learning experiences. And we have to give students control and freedom so that they can decide when it's time to study, what way they want to study, how fast they want to study. And we have to realize that education, it's an academic and an individual, and it's also a social experience. And it happens on campuses, but it happens in the net as well. And we have to figure out, and we don't think we really know now, you know, which is the time for net-based interaction, which is the time for sitting at home, listening to people like me uh, on, your net, on the net in real time, when it's best to uh, wait and record it. How important is it to be able to ask a question? And I hope you are thinking of a question to ask. Um, uh, so, the, but the net, the ubiquitous net context, uh, it, it creates all kinds of learning opportunities for us, and not just formal education, but informal learning uh, opportunities. And it creates opportunities uh, through interaction with other people and through the use of an interfact, uh, creation of artifacts, learning objects, if you like. Um, just a, a little bit of comparative data, and uh, I know that the Israel data, uh, Israel data on the right is a little bit dated, but uh, we, we see that 60% uh, of households in Israel have Internet access, and 91% of them have broadband access of those 60%. So you can see that, uh, and this was in 2004, I'm sure that in 2007 those numbers are significantly higher than that. They are, you are? Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's the same, maybe we're a little bit behind you in Canada, but uh, the uh, students are on the net, or, or adults, uh, children, uh, the average of 13.5% or 13.5 hours per week is spent on the net. Uh, it's the, you know, in the recent years, it's the first time uh, since te television was invented that the number of hours of television watching is going down, uh, and it's being substituted by the more interactive media available on the net. I think that speaks well for socialization and for education and for uh, creating better communities. This is a diagram I published in 2004 when I talked about what makes the net, or in this case I called it the educational semantic web. And you can see some of the social software tools, the read-write web, web 2.0, filtering and mashups and things that are just sort of emerging now. But there's basically three base affordances, and I've got a couple of slides on each one of these. First is the abundance of content. Content is going to be everywhere, available to almost anyone, anytime. And communications are coming at asynchronous, synchronous, all sorts of formats. And recently we've seen the development, and we'll see more <clears throat> in the future, of agents that are going to be able to help us to deal with some of the, the overabundance uh, of the net. So uh, this is a slide. I'm sure you've seen Star Trek, and those of us who are really old like me can remember even the first before the next generation to the original cast, and uh, here they are here. And I don't know if you, you recall it personally, but at the, at the first Star Trek, uh, they used to be able to go up to the wall, push the button. They would ask the computer any question. didn't matter what the question was. The answer came back. And in later years, they turned to the wrists, and they could ask that same question. And I think you think how, how the net, especially with Google these days, but also with other search engines, 
is allowing us to ask any question, any information, anytime, anywhere. And it isn't always the perfect first answer, but uh, when you ask anybody any question the first time, you're not always guaranteed that it'll be perfect. But you find that as your skills increase that those answers are available to you anytime, anywhere. We're also seeing content that will change in response to students' needs and response. You can have it customized so that it presents it in a unit that uh, uh, whether you work, work in metrics or in imperial systems, so that it changes uh, in, re in response to the weather, to uh, the stock market, to uh, the crop conditions. Uh, we, we see, of course, user-created content. Uh, Wikipedia, obviously the big example, but all kinds of blogging, uh, podcasts, vidcasts. And we're starting to see in education open content where uh, institutions are putting their content on the line and giving it away free. And uh, I, I'm going to focus a bit on Wikipedia because it's so ubiquitous, but it's spun off a whole bunch of uh, alternatives, wiki books, wiki, um, wiki how, wiki um, lessons, uh, wiki university. Uh, all sorts of different ways. And we can see institutions uh, started with MIT, but you can see that uh, Tufts University, Utah State, the Open University. And I like the quote from Terry Foote, one of the uh, founders of Wikipedia, who says, imagine a world in which every single person, every person in the world is given free access to the sum total of all human knowledge. And that's what we're doing. And there's very exciting work, uh, things like the $100 laptop computer project is uh, actually, they've got a few thousand of them have been produced, they're in uh, t testing now and uh, by summertime they're going to be delivering the first hundred, few hundred thousand of these machines. So I think it's exciting times with content being available and accessible by anyone. So content is f going to be free or very cheap. Uh, we need to learn to share our content, to reuse it, to pick stuff up, to make it serve our needs and our students' needs and, uh, and your needs, I guess, more importantly. Uh, but don't get, you, don't get hung up on thinking that you're going to create a, a zillion dollars by creating content. I think that what you have to do is add value to the content, learn how to customize it, learn how to turn it into something that meets specific needs to some learners or some users. Uh, in a particular context. Um, the second affordance of the net is, uh, is communications. Over here you see a, a mobile application. This is the Athabasca University Library. All of our library services are now available on mobile devices and we've recently been working with uh, trying to get past PDAs to uh, working on mobile telephones for quizzes and for uh, you know, trying to add an announcements and reminders to students. And uh, communications, it used to, well, you know, back to the old days of letter writing when it was all text-based or even uh, email, but now we're getting into a lot more uh, group-based and individual synchronous, asynchronous stuff, uh, text, audio, video, stored, indexed, retrievable. Uh, even now, I was just uh, uh, talking to Yoaf before this show started about how expensive it was to do this kind of technology even five years ago. And here we are now, uh, we'll, this will be stored and it will be available to anybody, anywhere, uh, all over the world at relatively low cost. Uh, it's mobile, it's embedded, it's pervasive, and it isn't just created by teachers, it's created by learners, it's created by communities, by publishers. So communication, again, is, is becoming ubiquitous. And one of the nice things about it is we have this ideal that communications has to be face-to-face, -face, that that's the only real communication. But I really love this quote by a student uh, written in 1997 who uh, says that I learned more about Clive or any student by reading his introduction tonight online than I did in an entire course sitting beside him last summer. So I think that the, you know, the opening up of human communications is going to be a really exciting uh, uh, world that we're building. And we're building multiple community networks and we're switching rapidly between them so that we have communities of our relatives, communities of our professional friends, our sports friends. And uh, those have been based upon who we've met in face-to-face, -face, but increasingly they're going to be based on who we meet uh, online and when we want to meet them. The third is uh, agents and uh, things like Google Alerts where if you want to be flattered, uh, you can 
tell Google uh, alert to search out the blog sphere and anytime anybody mentions your name or your sports team or your university or your employer or your boss or somebody who you're interested in or some event you're interested in, they'll send you an email and say, don't forget to look at this. Uh, meeting Wizard is a wonderful tool for if you have trouble setting up meetings with people. Uh, it uh, fully automated, free, on the web, keeps your address of all the people who you meet with, and you can. It'll send them an email saying which of these five dates is uh, accessible or are you open for, and it'll send them reminder notices. A wonderful tool. RSS, the glue that sort of links blogs and uh, wikis and entries uh, together. Uh, it's becoming more powerful, more ubiquitous, built into more and more email systems or, or access through browsers. Uh, we're starting to use uh, at Athabasca, we have a Freud bot where you can talk to Freud. Uh, we have an advisor system that changes in response to the courses that are available. And an agent that will see if you're ready for an independent or uh, continuous enrollment program at Athabasca University. Just examples of the kinds of agents that we're just at the edge of the of the uh, of the agent world. So all of these things together start the development of a participatory culture, uh, where there's relatively low barriers to getting into the game. There's strong support for creating and sharing one's I creations. And members believe that their contributions matter. And I think that's one of the nice things about blogging is when you get responses, you get feedback, it shows that people around the world are, are interested in you or interested in me. Just a little joke. Sometimes it's hard to make the world work. Uh, this, you can, all these affordances make it easy to participate, but... Uh, uh, as one dog says to the other, I used to have my own blog for a while, but I decided to go back to just pointless, incessant barking. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we have to create incentives. We have to add value to the things we publish and to the things we read. And we have to give feedback to people about the things that we like that they produce. Um, I know that uh, many of you are not teachers, but there is a whole growing interest in different pedagogy. So you got all these fancy tools. What do you actually do with them? How do you make your lessons? How do you make your learning experiences? How do you make them different? How do you improve upon them? And uh, I guess one of the most interesting work uh, is from a fellow Canadian, George Simons, a young, a young uh, 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 academic at the University of Manitoba. And he writes about connectivism uh, very clearly. And he talks about a new pedagogy for a new era. And uh, did you attend his, uh, he had a virtual conference last week and there was uh, over a thousand people registered for the conference. <coughs> he gave away knowledge and it was a, a wonderful thing. Uh, just my own community of inquiry model that uh, had some small part in. Uh, uh, and then three others, uh, uh, the pedagogy of nearness, an American Miegis who talks about uh, what it's, how we're going to be, we have to be able to learn to, uh, to learn online, learn offline, and mix the two together and, and see which is most important and when, figure out when it's best uh, to do either. Uh, Betty Collis writes about how important it is for students to control and to create curriculum, not just to be consumers. Because once you graduate, you're not going to be consuming content, you're going to be creating content, so you should have that experience. Uh, I'm also really interested in pattern languages and ways that we can create new instructional models and, uh, and describe them in ways that, that can be reproduced, but not just in cookie-cutter fashion, but can be customized. And finally, John Seeley Brown, famous uh, American educator, uh, computer scientist and educator, and he's got a recent article on what the new learning environment should look like. So it's interesting to look, if you look at the new technology, it's uh, personal, whereas the new learning is personalized, you know, a good match. It's user-centered to learner-centered. It's networked. It's situated, mobile, collaborative. They're both ubiquitous. New technology is durable. New learning is lifelong. The only big difference is that too much of our learning is expensive. Now, I know that maybe it's a, it, if you're fortunate enough to get into uh, into a university, maybe it's not so expensive in Israel. But uh, I know that uh, uh, in uh, Canada, 
uh, typically a student graduates from university, I think the average is with a $25,000 debt. And it's not a nice way to start one's professional de de degree. And then when we talk about real lifelong and worldwide education, we realize that there's hundreds of thousands of people who don't have access, so we have to do better. What is a learning network? Can you imagine a world where there are tens of thousands of online learning paths and imagine that they can be put together in all different ways and by learners and then you try to think how are we actually going to work this system? How will learners find and connect to particular paths and how will the univer Israeli universities thrive in this world? Will the students be going elsewhere? Will they be picking up courses that are better and cheaper produced in China or in America, or how is it all going to work? And I think there's huge challenges ahead for us, and huge opportunities, of course, too, because small uh, countries with high-tech expertise like Israel has has an opportunity to, you know, to to, to play on a worldwide uh, stage. I'm going to skip that one. Uh, the the real uh, push, though, is in lifelong learning, professional development. Uh, you know, have to move to learning out of an educational content, <coughs> excuse me, into one that stimulates, creates, rewards, and evaluates learning anytime, any place, anywhere, for any reason. And we have to start to think, are the tools that we are currently using, uh, are they really creating lifelong learners? My final kind of theoretical slide, this is a, a real actual photograph of an iceberg. And I think that in education, we're always over here trying to uh, help Learners, learners to learn about things uh, through explicitly uh, uh, talking about what, what the explicit knowledge th that, uh, that comes out of our curricula. But what's really important is learning to be, learning how to think, learning how to act appropriately, learning how to not be an idiot, uh, you know, and that requires a lot of tacit knowledge. And that's the area where we really need to work on. Uh, this stuff is kind of easy, although if you look at what we study in university, it's almost all up in this area. And trying to get down below this big iceberg to the important stuff is, is a challenge. And I think social software is part of that solution. So lifelong learning demands a move from institutional to learner-centered paradigm. And the personal learning environment, I'm going to argue, is a bit of a solution. It's a little bit away and far down the road, but uh, I'm hoping and I'm believing that we're moving in that direction. Okay, so what is a personal learning environment? Well, uh, the best report that I've read comes from the UK, the Future Lab, and they say that uh, the logic of educational systems has to be reversed so that systems conform to the learner rather than the learner to the system. And uh, we're already seeing that where you can, you can watch this lecture at your home anytime you want. And it's an example of where we're not forcing you to come to a learner san learning center, although you might want to, uh, and, you're off, and you still can. But uh, we're, we're trying to make it so that learning is available when you're ready for it. Um, some people say it's a concept, a PLE, an idea, an ideal. Some say it's just a reaction to institutional learning management systems. Uh, some people say it's all the tools that you use to learn. And some people think a PLE is just a cool new name to drop at cocktail parties demonstrating how cool you are. So um, if you haven't heard the uh, term PLE uh, before, now you can drop it and say that's where we're moving to in education anyway. It, web, a PLE is a web interface into the own, owner's digital environment. It incorporates content management uh, so that they, the things that they're, they're, the work they're doing, whether it's for school, for work, for sports, for play, for family, it's managed in an appropriate way. It's a profile system for making connections. It's a collaborative and a workplace, individual workspace. It's a multi-formatted communication system. And it's all syndicated and uh, distributed by feeds so that we can tie all these tools together. And my friend Stephen Downs, also another Canadian, has argued that a PLE is an approach, not an application. It values and builds upon the learner's input. It protects and it celebrates identity. It respects academic ownership, but it is net-centric. It's built, born, and bred on the net. It supports multiple levels of socializing, and it supports a community of inquiry across disciplines, programs, institutions, and learning contexts. Sure, I'll grab a drink here. 
What are the tools of PLEs, personal learning environments? Well, they're all the, the new technologies, the mobile computing, wireless, high bandwidth, cell phones, digital photography, internet video, and low-cost hardware, right down to the $100 laptop. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, with the PLE, if you're, uh, a, or sorry, an LMS, a learning management system. Uh, I know there's a number that are used here in, uh, <coughs> in Israel, including the one at Opus. Opus, used here at the Open University. Um, the, the, and I'm going to sort of compare personal learning environments and learning management systems. And maybe I'm talking a little bit in the future here, and it'll be a little bit uh, putting down learning management systems. Uh, I don't think we're ready to completely move over to PLEs and throw learning management systems away today, but I think their days are numbered. Uh, learning management systems were designed and built for and operated by institutions of formal learning. They're designed to meet teacher needs. They're based on a dissemination and a push rather than a pull by learners. The contributions are owned by the institution. Uh, so, if, if, so if I produce something, and uh, at least in, uh, it, at my institution, if a student puts uh, uh, some work into the contributions into their Moodle platform, at the end of the course, the course disappears, and that content disappears with it. It is a course-centric view of learning, whereas really, uh, you know, knowledge and learning doesn't happen based on courses. It's much broader. It's at least at the program level, if not at the lifelong learning level. And they're hard to interoperate with competitive products, and they're designed to protect individual property, not to make it pr uh, freely available. And finally, the other problem with LMS is they have a very poor record of innovation. It's taken them a long time to add blogs. Many of them don't yet have a blogging capacity, nor uh, something like an e-portfolio, although most of them have wikis now, so they, they are moving along. What is a personal learning environment? Uh, a good friend of mine says that we can think of a personal learning environment sort of like a spaceship that comes and docks with a, 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 a space lab or a, 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 it docks up for a certain length of time, but it doesn't, it isn't a part of that, uh, that institutional learning environment. So you have my work, my social life, my school, my files, my identity, all uh, sort of a learner-centric environment, and they will dock up to a space station when they want to and when they need to, but their individual integrity, all of this stuff stays and remains with, their, with them. So what are PLE activities? They're for making connections, for sharing artifacts, things that you created, essays, uh, projects that you work on. They're for applying knowledge on and offline. They're for sharing experiencing. And the teacher's job is to help learners determine and satisfy their learning needs and the need to create and support environment from which learning emerges. So we don't have to be teaching all the time. We have to create environments where learning happens. And this is a couple of people have drawn, mostly English uh, researchers have drawn what a PLE looks like. Uh, and this one you can see uses an LMS, a learning env environment, but it adds a whole bunch of other tools to it. So we see Moodle here. We see uh, things like Flickr, Frapper. We see Delicious for social bookmarking. And we see websites linked with RSS feeds, all bringing together to, in the middle, create a learner-centered online learning environment. Here's another example based upon the ELGG software that, that, that I've been using, a product out of Scotland, open source tool. But you can see now they have eliminated in this diagram the learning management system, and they're using blogs for what we usually use for web conferencing. Um, they're using uh, uh, community software, social networking software like Friendster, Friend of a Friend, uh, 43 Things for connecting people who are uh, working on targets together, Flash, uh, Technorati for linking all of the blog conversations that are happening. So all of these are sort of, uh, sort of conceptual models rather than you can't go out and buy a personal learning environment. You can buy any of these, so you can buy, you can use any of these social software tools for free. But how do we put them together and how do we do it easily so that students can benefit from them and so it doesn't drive teachers crazy trying to uh, keep on top of all of them? That's our challenge. 
or Google for Educators. You know, the Google set of applications is growing tremendously. We have Google Documents, uh, word processors on the net. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Google Earth, or you certainly should be. In fact, uh, if you're really getting bored, you should run up Google Earth and find out where Athabasca is and zoom down on it, but uh, keep half your attention with me. Um, there are actually uh, PLE prototype products. Um, this here's uh, Flock, which uh, is a uh, is is they they they're trying to create a, another browser so that instead of using um, a Firefox or Explorer, you use a, a browser that has blogging and various many various uh, web tool or uh, social software tools built right into it. ELGG, the one that I just talked about. Um, and then there's uh, Plex, which is basically an RSS reader on steroids that really tries to ramp up what, uh, wh how you connect and how you look at your RSS world. As a brief example of how I use it in my courses, um, I do use an LMS, a Moodle. Um, we have blogging connections that are uh, blogging that's provided through the ELGG system. I've renamed it to me to you at Athabasca. Uh, we have uh, uh, connect, uh, connections with the profiles that are available so learners can find each other, can find out who's interested in motorcycle racing and, uh, and any other personal thing as well as their educational uh, activities. We use real-time interaction web con co uh, conferencing, much like we're doing right now. We use a product called Illuminate. Um, and we use social bookmarking so that when we find something, we can share it with other people. And the tasks that people do. We have a question from the chat ah. uh, regarding your previous slide. Sure. If you can go back. I can. Thank uh, you for the question. Oh. I'll go back. Another. Oh, it's oh, another sorry. one back. Okay, this one. Sure. Um, aren't you afraid that uh, students are going to get lost in all the, the for won't see the forest for the trees because there are so many tools yeah. which create uh, probably cognitive load, as we've heard yesterday in the conference. Yeah. And uh, the way to make meaning of all those tools actually may hinder uh, a meaningful learning experience. Right. Well, I think it's a, it's a literacy question. Uh, is you know is the effort that's going to be required uh, is, is it going to bear returns, and in, in, in what term, in the short term or the long term? Uh, I think that the problem is itself going to go away as students become more and more net literate. They're going to know that oh yeah, this is that type of application, and oh yeah, well I I would I don't use that application. I use this application, and it does the same thing. Uh, in the in the in the short term, the problem is not only for learners; it's all for teachers too, and maybe even a greater problem for teachers. And I guess um, I, I guess I don't think that we're going to that one has to jump into the full forest, as was illustrated in that slide. Uh, and then that's the reason why I guess I take a subset of those and and try to try to incorporate you know three or four of these, not eight or ten of them, but um, and I guess I, th I think that it's part of learning to be a lifelong learner and that sometime or another, uh, if we don't give our students exposure to these things, if we don't throw them into a challenge of, of you know, I've never, uh, how do I learn how to do this? Well, they immediately, maybe some of them will, will phone you up as a teacher and bother you and you'll think, you know, is it really, is this cognitive load worth it? But in the end, if we teach them how to te how to learn, how to learn to learn use a new tool, then we'll be giving them a lifelong learning skill. So our curriculum, the the learning objectives of our particular course may suffer in the short term. Uh, is it worth it? I think it is because it becomes a lifelong learning skill. Uh, and I think that just like with foreign languages, your fourth foreign language is, easy, is uh, your fifth one is easier, and your sixth one is easier. I think it happens in this kind of environment as well. So thank you for the question. I know that I sort of skirted around. Uh, you can get in trouble by, by going, uh, di you know, gi giving too much forest or too many trees, but uh, reducing the number of trees so that uh, uh, people think that a forest is a single tree isn't a solution either. Let me go back. Um, okay, so, you know, I, I was saying we have all of these tools. 
Uh, I've been doing a little bit of research trying to figure out uh, with, with a very small number, only nine students in the, this, this uh, sample uh, completed this survey out of 13. But I asked them which of these was most useful. And uh, it was interesting that uh, uh, the web conferencing seemed to be uh, the real-time stuff was really attractive, uh, building a community in real time. Uh, the blogging world uh, came in second in, in, in total for, for sharing with its asynchronous nature. And uh, uh, the email, which I thought, and in, in past a few years ago, email would have been much higher, but I think it's being replaced as one finds alternatives that are more permanent, more organized, and are so, more social than a traditional email. So what are the advantages of a learning uh, management system? Are they purposely designed? They're mature? They're safe? Our, our computer services department likes to support them, knows how to support them. Uh, they're relatively easy to use, and they're centrally supported. The advantage of a personal learning environment is the identity. It's the student's work, the student's environment, uh, the customization. The students can, can customize and control them, as can the individual teacher. The student owns them. There's enhanced social presence because they bring that environment with them. Uh, they bring their, their pictures, their links to their hobbies with them into the environment. Uh, they're very fast for <coughs> innovation and capacity for changing and swapping in and out. And they're, open, they're, they're designed from the, from, from the beginning to have open connectivity with uh, common APIs, mashups, uh, web services. Um, but are they really ready for, uh, are PLEs ready for prime time, as they say in the States anyways? Um, I guess I'm not sure. Uh, uh, there's a URL down here at the bottom. I've just moved the picture. And uh, you can see on my blog I, uh, I, I posted a discussion about are PLEs, are they ready for, for use now? And I concluded that it's a little premature. They're ready for the early adopters for sure. Uh, maybe they're not ready yet for... Uh, uh, for our mainstream faculty, but I think there's some value in supporting their use by early adopter uh, faculty and by students. Um, some people see uh, PLEs as just not even relevant to formal education. They say they're really designed for people after they're out of edu uh, school and out of university. That they're, they're they're just for you know informal learning. Um, I t tend to think not, but uh, that's where they're situated today anyways. And one of the bloggers who responded to uh, my uh, blog posting that our PLE is ready for prime, prime time came back and said, you're, you know, you're thinking like a teacher, you know, why, why don't you get it so that when p learners are creating their own learning environments, and I confess I do think like a teacher, uh, too many years as being a teacher, I guess. But he, they, this blogger said that Terry appears to be perpetuating the teacher-learner divide. And, uh, well, maybe I am. But uh, you can see the discussion that's going on in the blog world about personal learning environments. Uh, I also did a, 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 published a paper recently where we compared blogs to threaded discussions. And we can see the advantages from a cognitive presence, from creating social presence, and creating teaching presence. Uh, the biggest problem is that from t a teaching presence, they, the poor navigation and tracking right now, difficult to follow conversation, harder to assess what's going on, and little institutional support. So there's where I think the challenges we have. Uh, we do have increased depth and increased social presence, and, and, and I think potential for increased cognitive presence. Uh, but uh, blogs, again, are not to be used alone. They're, they're just one part of a communication suite, usually. So it's a, a paradox if you're a formal educator in that they're challenging to learn how to use. Uh, they can become a, a, not only a forest, as our, as our caller noted, but they can become a jungle. They're unstable and unsupported, and they're not as administratively effective for either students or faculty. So why bother to use them? Well, uh, the answer, I think, well, here's a road map. People have said, well, first we're going to start with individual applications existing web uh, applications, and then we're going to gradually move till that the institution is able to support them in, in the long run. And this is a number of years away. Um, but what's, what's been interesting to me is to see 
what a, a complexity or chaos theory or complexity theory has to say. And they say that, uh, that a complex system, when disturbed or threatened by some change in the environment, and of course, I'm thinking now of formal education are being disturbed or threatened by a change in the environment, and the, that change is the net. They can be lured by tractors and feedback modifiers out of a sense of equilibrium towards the edge of chaos. And the advantage of this, when you get to the plane on the edge of chaos, is not that it becomes chaotic, but that emergent behaviors arise. And some of them are going to work for us. They're going to allow the institutions to, to become you know, much better at educating than we have ever been in the past. Some of them are going to be blind alleys. They're going to be just a waste of time. But if we're not out there playing and we're not allowing students to amplify the, feed, the things that they're, they're working for them and to damp off those that are that are not working for them, then we're never going to progress. We're never going to you know move uh, education to, to to really be a lifelong learning asset for for all of us. Um, so the edge of chaos is a sweet spot. It's a zone of high creativity, innovation, and it allows us to break with the past to create new modes of operating. So. If I was running the computer services department, this would all be very scary, and it would be easy for me to say, we must use learning management systems, and that's the only tool to do. But I think if we don't allow a part of our energies to go into these new, new, these new tools, we'll be, putting, we'll be basically denying a future for our institutions. Another question from the sure. is, uh, why does PLE need to replace an LMS? Can they coexist? Why does one have to drive the other to extinction? <laughs> well, that's a good question, and maybe, maybe they won't. Uh, and I think maybe that's where we're at now, is we're, as the diagram I showed with, with the Moodle in there and the way I'm using Moodle, you can substitute any uh, Opus or any of the other systems around. Um, I guess one of the problems with, with, with LMSs is that they just seem to have a, a real challenge in, uh, in, 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 in opening themselves to allow so that logins can move across, so that you can give the capacity uh, for security which, and security of marks and institutional things that, that shouldn't be shared and allow them to move out into a, a sort of a shared environment. And whereas if you go from the other way where you start pulling the pieces together from the ground from, from, from the first basis, then you start with a different mindset about how to apply security and logins. And uh, I, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. Maybe they will continue to, to exist, but one could easily imagine all of the functions of a current LMS being made up from mix and match small pieces that can be put together to create uh, the equivalent of a learning management system, only one that's more adaptable to individual learners. So we, we, that's exactly what's going to happen in the short run. In the short run, LMSs are including like uh, uh, the biggest um, uh, WebCT Blackboard consortium now. They're, they're saying they're adding blogs. People have argued whether, whether it's a real blog or not, if it isn't sending out RSS feeds to the world, such like that. But they, they are going to adapt. They're, they're going to feel threatened as, uh, as, as systems. And, uh, and you know, maybe, maybe they will continue to hold everything under one house. But uh, I tend to think that uh, the, the, the systems like Sakai and Moodle, which, uh, which again, are open source such that the, that code is open to everyone, will be more open to being, becoming personal learning environments than will the proprietary systems that we see in operation today. Okay, I think my second last slide, again, more about complexity theory, and maybe it's too small to even read. I think it is. Uh, but anyways, uh, the quote that living systems thrive only when pushed away from their comfort zone, the area in which they must reconfigure uh, themselves. Uh, we need variation, interaction, and selection. And if you're stuck with one particular system that hasn't changed in five years, it's not likely to have variation. Uh, interaction outside of its own established system and no selection of new tools except what uh, the manufacturer might uh, offer to you. So there is no PLE best practice. There's no one tool 
but the point isn't to find the best learning strategy, but to evolve different systems that continually search, explore, and test out different strategies. So just to finish off, to get back to Time Magazine, <clears throat> you know, they celebrated uh, you, the blogger, the wiki writer, the uh, podcaster, as the person of the year. But what happened to Time Magazine? Well, on January 19th, they announced they were eliminating 300 jobs, and they're celebrating the fact that maybe the magazine or the kind of magazine that they are producing uh, is going to have a real challenge. Uh, what we have to do as educational educators, too, is that we have to continue running the old business while we reinvent the new business. So uh, how do you make this transition? I like Stephen Down says, you've got to be the person you want your person, pupils to be. You've got to try some of these tools. Uh, you have to support a culture of reflection, innovation, and teaching scholarship, like we saw at the Chase uh, conference uh, yesterday. I mean, that was what it was all about, people sharing their innovations, their reflections, uh, and talking about the scholarship of teaching. I think we should use open standard and interoperable tools. They might be uh, proprietary tools, but they should be open standard and they should be interoperable. Um, and uh, my own advice is to uh, try a new tool every, every course you teach. Make sure that you're learning as well as your students are learning. So to conclude, the context of both formal and lifelong learning is changing very rapidly, creating opportunity and risk. Uh, positive adaptation requires allowing students more choice, teachers more choice, and the role of management is to create an ecology of innovation, testing, and reflection while keeping the ship afloat, and, uh, and that there's no single killer app in this environment. Rather, there's an evolving set of personal, social tools, pedagogy, and resources. And I'll end with John Dewey, an uh, American educator who's always got wonderful things to say, even though he said them, uh, well, uh, over 100 years ago when he first started writing. But uh, he says, the great community is a subtle and delicate, vivid and responsible art of communication must take possession of the physical machinery of transmission and circulation and breathe life into it. And I think that's what we're doing with these applications. We're breathing life into the net. And when the machine age has thus perfected its machinery, it will be a means of life and not its despotic master. So your comments or questions are most welcome, uh, either now or uh, via email. Uh, there's my email address there. Again, the, the link to the Future Lab report uh, was called Social Software and Learning. It's uh, perhaps the best uh, uh, article that I've seen on social software and personal learning environments. So I, I see we have uh, 12 yeah. minutes. Well, we have one question. Good. Okay, from the chat. Um, regarding this uh, very rapid change of uh, online technologies that are emerging, and uh, remembering uh, a phrase that I've heard during a visit at the Open University of UK, which was the mirage of stability of any technology. <laughs> it's a mirage that goes away as soon as you master it or approach it. Aren't you afraid that faculty is, gonna, is not going to be um, challenged to actually meet the requirements of the students? I mean, there is a generation gap and there is a digital gap between us, teachers, and our students, which are becoming younger and more, uh, I would say, fluent with the newest technologies. Right, but the students aren't becoming younger. We're becoming older. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's true. Um, yeah, uh, well, I mean, some people say the solution is death and retirement, you know, one of the two. Uh, I, but I, I, don't, I don't think it has to be that uh, pessimistic. I mean, I think that uh, by and large academics are learners, and uh, they, they want to learn, and they will learn. They, they learned, all of them learned how to use word processors. They learn how to search the, the net for library references for their research. They learn how to use technologies in their physics labs. And, uh, but for some reason, they haven't learned how to use much beyond uh, a whiteboard uh, in many classes. And so it's not that they can't learn. It's just that, A, we haven't had the incentives or the sticks and the carrots to, to help them and to encourage them. Uh, and I, but I, I, I really, I guess I have a faith that, uh, that academics are smart people and uh, 
that the, if, if we can, you know, make, make it clear enough that learning and lifelong learning is important for them and it's most important for their students, I think that we can make great strides uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, in, in helping and forcing and uh, encouraging faculty to adopt some of these tools. But I wouldn't be naive to th suggest that all faculty are going to be on that cutting edge, and it isn't required that they all be there. But it's required that our institution has room for for a large no or a growing number of people to uh, to become not just literate, you know, but authors of this era. So I think it can be. I think it can happen. Um, but I wouldn't uh, count on every stu every teacher, nor do I count on every student having all these skills either, because we see huge variability of students coming into the system. Yeah. So let me get back to a, a, um, a point that you mentioned in your keynote lecture yesterday at the conference. You said something about ge geologists being so uh, <laughs> keen or higher higher up in the in the system yeah. because they monitor the pace of change so <laughs> they, they uh, can coming, really appreciate yeah they can appreciate yeah so uh, <laughs> uh, just adopting to using basic tools like word processing or even I mean rudimentary LMS functions in our university took us a couple of years yeah, yeah. and uh, now the, the technology is way ahead of what the average faculty member is using yeah, yeah. so well, well, that's true, um, and maybe I was being a little trying trying to create a joke more than anything. But um, uh, you know, now that those students are now the students, now that the faculty can use an LMS, uh, I mean, to me that means that they have keyboard skills. They they know what uh, th that the uh, email is twenty four hours a day. I mean, you've gone the hardest part. They are on the net. Uh, they do know email. They know how to do a threaded conference. So. The other is, I think it's incremental. I hope that for each of these tools that we're sure to stress the relative advantage for them. And and sometimes the, the problem is when there's a huge relative advantage for the students and not much for the faculty. That's when you get the, 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 the problem. So we have to think, well, we can't disadvantage students, but we have to think how can we make it so that this is better for our faculty members. And that means sometimes bribing them with better tools, uh, sending them off to conferences, giving them uh, a 12-year-old to help them out every now and again, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, okay. Uh. So, uh, I see, oh, we have a viewer from actually from Los Angeles. Ah. Who's, yeah, he's in California. He used to work with us. Um, let me see if he has a questions. Okay. Well, he has no questions. So I think we'll wrap up here, if that's okay with you. That's fine with so me. So thank you, everyone, for watching us. This uh, recording will be posted on the website of uh, the Chase Center in a week or so, so you can watch it again and again and again. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure Professor Anderson will be happy to answer each and every query of yours <laughs> once you flood either his blog or his uh, website or write him uh, an email. So thank you very much, and shalom, everyone. Shalom. Thank you.